Um, I've just been given my opening line, uh, which was a conversation in the corridor overheard by Ida, um, who's going to be talking after this, um, <coughs> which was, what's happening? Who's giving a lecture? And then this big Bobby, so who was the answer? Own up to that. Who was that? Who was that embarrassing us? In front I'm, of not, I'm not pointing in, fingers. In point, important <laughs> international guests. Um, my name, for those online, is Tim Jackson. I'm director of CUSP, and I'm leading this module on ecological economics. Um, and, and most of the people you can see, if you look at the um, what we're screen sharing at the moment, but if you're lucky enough to find the camera that's pointed towards this lovely group of people, they are mostly this year's ecological economics students and a few additional guests. And we also have some guests online. And for me, that is just a huge pleasure and a privilege. And I'll tell you why, because you know we think of ideas as arriving fully formed in the world. They just appear one day and that's it. You know, ecological economics is a thing, obviously, isn't it? And that, of course, is never the case. Things emerge through people and through the actions that people take and through their interactions with each other and through the discussions they have, just like the discussions we're having this week on the module. And that happened, of course, with ecological economics. And actually, the people who were there at the beginning, and they were there at the beginning before I was thinking in those terms were uh, primarily people like Bob and in particular Big Bobby himself uh, who, who was one of the <laughs> yes that, I don't think that's supposed to be meant in a physical <laughs> sense Bill, I'm pretty sure it's the profile that you have and and the profile that you rightly have because because that initial building of ecological economics out of nothing out of nowhere was an effort of um, mind of will of intellect of discussion and those things take you know they particularly when you're doing that in a field like economics which is not exactly welcoming what you have to say about it is an effort that requires will resilience and a strength of purpose uh, that, that Bob exhibited in those early days and has carried with him throughout. When I first met Bob, I think I was working for the Stockholm Environment Institute, Bob, back in the ni early 1990s, I think it was. Um, and and this and he had already at that stage he had this kind of you know this is Bob Costanza. He's the founder, one of the founders of ecological economics. And I went to visit him actually, and I think we were in Maryland at that time. And he just kind of picked me up from the station and he said, hi, Tim, you know, what do you want to talk about? And that's the kind of character, actually, that is another quality of someone who has this intellectual leadership, not just to have that resilience and be able to take the fight where it's needed to be taken, but actually to reach out and to collaborate and to be there with people who've tried to go along the same journey and to inspire along the way. So, Bob, there's one, for me, why it's a really personal moment, actually, to be able to welcome you here to teach on a course about ecological economics. Since that time, um, Bob has moved from Maryland, I think you were in Portland for a while, you were in um, Canberra in Australia for a while, Vermont at some point as well. Yes, where there is now a school of ecological economics, which is very much um, Bob's doing. And he's now moved to the Institute for Global Prosperity, which to some extent is a kind of sister institute to CUSP which we have here in Surrey, and we can now finally <coughs> not just work very closely with each other, but also teach on each other's courses, visit each other, see each other physically, which of course is a luxury. So that's enough for me, but I hope I've given you a sense that, you know, wherever you look in life and wherever your intellectual journey takes you, you will look to other people and they will be the people to inspire you and lead you and change things in the world then you will move on to be in a position where you can do that as well and you can change uh, the ideas around you and that progress of ideas I think is one of the most important aspects of academia there's a lot about academia that is slightly problematic it's a very competitive environment the peer review structure doesn't always work very well you're pushed into publication avenues that don't particularly do anything more than reinforce the status quo but it does actually have this extraordinary ability to bring different ideas together. When it's working properly, academic research is about that building of ideas, that collaborating on ideas, and giving credence to each other's ideas. It's a very important function, a sort of value in the value system that is the academic system. And so 
With that said, and with no further ado, and giving all the value that I personally feel to the work that Bob has done over these years, I am delighted to hand over to you, Bob, to talk about what is ecological economics. And why do we need it more now than ever? Bob. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks very much, Tim, for that great introduction. And I think it's the first live lecture I've been in, in, uh, <coughs> since, since COVID. It's really strange to see everybody's complete bodies there, and not just their, their faces. And so uh, it's great, great to be here. Um, and great to be at, uh, at UCL, at the Institute for Global Prosperity, which, as Tim said, is a sister institute. And hopefully we can do more, more things together uh, going forward. So um, I'm sure you've all heard the term Anthropocene. Anybody not heard this term before? OK, this is the, the geologic epic that we're currently in uh, that uh, uh, recognizes that human influence on our planet is so large uh, that we're having impacts on a whole range of biophysical phenomena, the climate, the, the, uh, the nitrogen cycle, the whole, the whole range of how our <coughs> ecological life support system functions. This means, I think this changes everything. I think this is one of the rationales for why we need an ecological economics. We need an economics that really looks at the whole system, uh, not just the market, not just you know what's going on within within a subset, a subsystem of, of the whole system. So business as usual is no longer an option. You know, and our, if our goal is, and I think it should be, and I think this is something we need to really get more clarity on uh, to get out of this, this addiction, uh, is we want to create a sustainable and desirable planet. You know? And if we're going to do that, I think we need to think and act quite differently. Uh, <clears throat> we need to build an economy that's based on this idea of sustainable well-being for humans and the rest of nature. I put it in that, in that form uh, very deliberately. It's not humans and nature, it's humans and the rest of nature. We're all part of this complex interdependent <coughs> system. And I think that's a fundamental aspect of, of ecological economics that makes it uh, different from uh, the, the conventional views. Conventional view is, you know, there's the economy over here, there's society over here, there's the environment over here. There are some interconnections between them, maybe a bit more overlap. But in reality, um, you know, it's more like this. The economy is embedded within society, embedded within the rest of nature. So that fundamental shift, I think, in, in worldview, um, I think, is what's behind a lot of the, the thinking in ecological economics. And still, uh, unfortunately, um, you know, the conventional view in, in many cases, in many, in many current disciplines. So <clears throat> if we're going to solve these problems, I think we need to make that shift. Um, this is another way of showing that, um, that you may have seen in some of the uh, earlier textbooks, you know, that there's a the finite global ecosystem driven by solar energy, essentially. Uh, there's an e economic subsystem that's taking energy and resources from that global ecosystem and, uh, and depositing energy and resources into it. You know, and, this is, and some of that uh, matter is recycled. Um, but the problem is now in the Anthropocene, that economic subsystem, or at least its influence, has gotten so large that, that it's a, um, a, major, uh, a major issue. And we've gone from an empty world to what you might call a full world. So ecological economics is economics for a full world. Um, I think the conventional view may have been OK in an empty world, um, but it's certainly no longer OK. Um, Tim said that these ideas came out of nowhere, but I don't think they, any ideas come out of nowhere. Um, so there's a long history of people that were thinking along similar lines, you know, even back to Adam Smith, you know, who's, who's uh, famous for the invisible hand, but he was really much more nuanced than that about what the economy was and what it was for. Uh, <clears throat> so there's, there's a long history of individuals, and uh, <clears throat> my background actually is in, was not in economics, uh, it was in systems ecology. Uh, my PhD advisor was, was Howard Odom, um, and I actually took economics as a foreign language as part of my, my uh, PhD studies. <laughs> so <clears throat> I got enough economics, I think, to get inoculated, but not enough. You know, I got the vaccine, uh, <laughs> but not the, uh, I didn't catch the disease. So, um, <clears throat> and also I've worked with uh, Eleanor Ostrom and Herman Daly in particular uh, on developing this, this field of ecological economics. Um, and we started this back in at least the formal field of ecological economics 
uh, when I was at Louisiana State University, my first, my first job, uh, where Herman Daly was also on the faculty of economics. <clears throat> and yeah, we were having trouble getting our papers published anywhere because there was no venue for the kinds of things that we were, we were both trying to do. And so we decided, well, the solution is we need to start a new journal. And so we started uh, this journal, Ecological Economics, back in 1989, <coughs> and it's been running ever since, and I think is doing quite successfully. Um, I'm sure Tim has published 24 articles in this journal, I think the last time I looked, right? <laughs> Uh, and so it's been, I think, a very um, important venue uh, for having this discussion of what, you know, what is it that we're trying to accomplish here? How do we look at uh, the whole system of humans and the rest of nature in a more integrated way? Uh, and uh, I think that's what we're, we're trying to do. Um, this is how I defined it in the first issue of the journal in 1989 addresses the relationships between ecosystems and economic systems in the broadest possible sense. They're the locus of many of our most pressing current issues or problems. And I listed, you know, sustainability. I think acid rain may be not quite as, as big a problem as we thought then, but the rest of them I think are all uh, still the kind, same kinds of problems that we're worried about. Uh, <clears throat> climate change, uh, biodiversity loss, and, um, increasing inequality. <clears throat> they're not well covered by any existing discipline. So that's what we were trying to do. How do we get a more systems level approach? Uh, how do we understand the whole interconnected system? Of course, once we had a, a journal, we, we figured, well, we need a society to go along with the journal. So, so we started the International Society for Ecological Economics. Um, this is the website. <coughs> Uh, and we, of course, then we had to have regular meetings of this society. The first one we had in 1990 at the World Bank, of all places. Um, and that was because Herman Daly, there, there's Herman, uh, <clears throat> happened to have, uh, have gotten a job there at the World Bank. He moved from LSU, from Louisiana State, to uh, the World Bank. About the same time, I moved to the University of Maryland. And he was able to convince them you know, to let us hold a, a conference there. <clears throat> um, we thought we'd get maybe 50 or 60 people coming to this conference. In fact, we got about 400 people showing up at the World Bank. So we thought, hey, I think we're on to something. Uh, we had a workshop after the conference um, at Y Island and <clears throat> produced this um, collection of articles that were, that were largely the contribu contributions of the various participants. Uh, at the conference. And here's a list of some of them. You may recognize some of these people. Jackie McGlade, doesn't she look exactly the same? <laughs> Who's also at, uh, at IGP now. Um, <clears throat> this is Herman Daly. This is uh, Kenneth Boulding, who I mentioned before. Um, a few other people that you may or may not recognize. Tim, you probably recognize some of these people. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, so, um, and Ecological economics is the science and management of sustainability. How do we understand this whole global system and the place of humans, the place of society, the place of uh, the biophysical environment? How do all these things interact with each other going forward? And how do we create, I think it also explicitly had a very positive design element to it. You know, how do we create a better world? How do we create this world that's, that's more sustainable and more desirable? How do we create sustainable well-being? So that, I think, requires these three elements and their integration. First of all, having an adequate vision of how the world is. How do we understand this complex system? So the, and I think we've made a lot of progress on, on that, um, both in the biophysical environment, you know, how do we understand Earth system science, how the global uh, planet is working, uh, how ecosystems function, uh, but also on the, on the social environment. You know, what actually does contribute uh, to human well-being, uh, the whole field of positive psychology, and those sorts of areas. Um, <clears throat> Ida will talk a bit more about this um, after, after me. But we also need a vision of how we would like the world to be. You know, what's, our, what's our goals for the future? And if our goals are simply grow GDP you know, indefinitely, that's, that's one thing. But I think our goals need to be different than that. They need to be, you know, how do we create sustainable well-being? And so we'll talk a little bit more about that. Our tools and analytical techniques also need to be more consistent 
with these goals. And I think to do that, we need more systems thinking, we need systems modeling, we need to, to understand how this complex system functions. And uh, Tim and, and Peter Victor have been working on some really interesting macro models about how the, this integrated system functions. I think we need to do uh, a lot more <clears throat> along those lines. And um, finally, we need uh, some different kinds of implementation. I think we need new kinds of institutions that can really steward these, especially our, our remaining uh, common assets uh, going forward. And we need um, societal therapy. I think one of the problems is that we're, we're stuck, we're addicted, we're locked into the current system. And in order to get out of that addiction, we have to first of all recognize it's an addiction, and second of all, try to devise some therapies that will, that will help. Uh, so I'll talk a bit, bit more about that. Uh, so we know that um, there are fundamental ecological constraints. We live on a finite planet. Uh, you've probably seen some version um, of of this article, and probably we'll talk about this more in, in the rest of the class, about planetary boundaries. Has this come up before? Yeah, okay. So you know, you know what's going on there. We know that, that uh, you know, we're probably already outside the safe operating space for humanity as far as climate change, biodiversity, the nitrogen cycle, uh, and rapidly approaching some of the other biophysical boundaries. Um, <clears throat> we know that there are potential climate tipping points that we're probably rapidly uh, approaching. And that's part of the reason for staying within the safe boundary. We don't really know where these tipping points are. Uh, but we know if we get to one, we get to the edge of a cliff, uh, you know, we, we may, things may change very quickly and unpredictably. Um, this is from some work that uh, Will Stefan and others have done recently. Uh, so we can, we can begin to look at you know, what the trajectory, the possible trajectories are going forward. Uh, uh, in the climate area, but I think in terms of other areas as well. Uh, we know that we're at you know, a potential tipping point both for climate, but also I think uh, for society. You know, can we manage uh, to, to get into a, a better, uh, <clears throat> more sustainable and desirable uh, uh, trajectory and avoid you know, uh, going into the collapse <coughs> of a hothouse earth uh, scenario, which is where we may well be, be headed. Uh, so I think our goal is really how do we how do we understand this goal, you know, both from a climate but also from a, a broader societal point of view? And how do we change things or influence decisions, you know, at this point where we're at now to, to help us increase the probability of getting there? We can't give up. We can't just say, oh, we're headed down this trough. You know, we, we are not. We're not there yet. Uh, I think we can still make some significant changes. So, um, and we need to be, um, Remember that we have to stay within those planetary boundaries, but we also have to create all of the elements of well-being and quality of life, uh, you know, the, the social floor, as it's been called uh, by Kate, Kate Rayworth, and then the sort of donut model. How do we <clears throat> create the safe and just operating space uh, for, for humans going forward? And um, this is not the only idea out there, at least not anymore. Uh, so, you know, Logical economy, you've probably heard several of these terms before. The circular bioeconomy, the well-being economy, you know, the regenerative economy, ecological civilization. China has been you know, pushing this idea of ecological civilization. Uh, not sure that they have the same like, the same uh, meaning of it that we do, but but uh, it's, it's uh, definitely on the agenda. The donut economy, the steady state economy. <clears throat> this one I particularly like. And I noticed that IKEA actually has um, Lagom in their an agenda <laughs> for Lagom living. Uh, and I, I think I saw on your website that somebody was doing some work on that. Lagom means everything is just enough. You know, it's, uh, you're not suffering, <clears throat> it's not a sacrifice, uh, but it's not overconsumption as well. So it's like, how do you get an economy that's really uh, producing just enough, equitably distributed uh, for, uh, for everyone going forward? Sustainable well-being, I think it's a good, a good word for it as well. So I think there are some shared key points um, from all of these, uh, these ideas I talked about going uh, before, that growth in material consumption is unsustainable because there are fundamental planetary boundaries. When you live on a finite planet, the economy cannot continue to grow um, indefinitely, <clears throat> at least in material terms. I think that's one of the, the, um, the basic ideas behind ecological economics. 
that growth in material consumption beyond this threshold, you know, that's probably already been reached in many, in many places, in many countries, uh, is not really desirable. You know, it has all these negative side effects that I'll talk, talk more about, uh, and uh, especially on social and natural capital. And it doesn't really improve well-being. Uh, so some places are going to need to increase, increase material consumption. Many others could probably be better off if they decrease their, their material consumption. So how do we find that, that log ohm spot? You know, where do we, how do we get one space that's, that's uh, just the right amount for everyone? And there are viable alternatives uh, that, that are both sustainable and desirable, uh, but they're going to require a fundamental change in our goals, in our worldview, uh, and, in, and in the entire system. And making fundamental change is, is always hard. Uh, so I'll get back to this, this in a bit. That's, I think that's why we're, we're still addicted and we haven't made that fundamental change. Is there are a lot of positive reinforcements for the current system uh, that are acting in the, the other direction. So, um, a second book we produced on ecological economics, the first edition came out in 1997, I think this is the, the uh, second edition now uh, that Ida was co-author on along with Herman Daly and several others. Um, and just to put up the three fundamental questions or goals, I guess, of ecological economics, which are to create an ecologically sustainable scale or size or magnitude of the economy, so staying within planetary boundaries. Uh, a socially fair distribution of wealth and resources, both within the current generation, but also between current and future generations and between humans and other species. You know, so this idea of fairness, equity, uh, I think is essential if you're really talking about well-being. If you're just talking about income, uh, maybe not so much. Uh, but we're not talking about income. We're talking about overall well-being, income as, a, as an input to that, but not the, the end product. And finally, having an economically efficient allocation of resources. And to do that efficiently, um, even within the conventional view of economics, you've got to have no externalities. Uh, but there are huge externalities out there. Uh, we we're even able to quantify to some degree how big those externalities are. And in fact, they're probably bigger than the internalities these days. Uh, so we're not getting an efficient allocation. It's certainly not fair, and it's certainly not sustainable. We're outside the safe operating space. How do we change that? That's, I think, our fundamental goals and problems. Um, so, just to take a step back, you know, what's, what is the problem in terms of vision or worldview? And uh, this is kind of a conventional, empty world vision of the economy at the macro scale, anyway. You have, you know, the primary factors of production, land, labor, and capital, but you can see that there's almost perfect substitutability assumed between these factors. You don't really need land or natural resources. You just need you know, more capital and labor <clears throat> in order to produce more goods and services um, as measured by GDP, marketed goods and services, which are then either consumed in the current period or invested to make more capital so you can produce more in the, in the next period. So you know, the basic premises behind this vision of the world is that more is always better you know, all else being equal, sure, wouldn't you want more instead of, instead of less? And that GDP is a good proxy for national, for national welfare. Um, another premise is there's nothing in this vision that prevents the economy from growing forever. You know, so uh, the idea is a healthy economy is one that's growing. It's not growing, you know, uh, it's not doing the, doing the job. Poverty is best solved with more growth. Um, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats, when in fact we know that the rising tide only lifts all yachts. In fact, probably only Russian oligarch plucked yachts. Um, <clears throat> and nature is a slideshow. Um, so there's nothing, there's really no need to have natural resources even or, or natural systems uh, as long as we have capital and labor. And that private property is always best because if you're talking about marketed goods and services, um, those are best handled with, with uh, private property rights. So <clears throat> how is that different from I think the kind of model that we need in the full world, uh, and that's, here's some of the differences, that we need to recognize that, that all four of these basic types of assets are all required uh, in a more balanced way uh, to produce both conventional goods and services, uh, but also human well-being more broadly conceived. So in addition to conventional built capital, uh, you need human capital, individual people, 
uh, not just their labor, but their, their health, their education, their, their innovation capabilities. Uh, you need social capital. You need all of the interactions between people, uh, our formal and informal networks, you know, our institutions, our cultures, uh, etc. And you need natural capital, everything else that we didn't have to produce, the free, the free gifts of nature. And um, <clears throat> those, those um, types of assets uh, interact uh, to produce conventional in the, in the economy, to produce the conventional economy, to produce goods and services, but they also contribute to well-being more directly through ecosystem services, through uh, the, the contributions of social, uh, social capital and community, etc. So we're learning a lot more about what actually does contribute uh, to well-being. And it's a lot more complicated than simply uh, subsistence uh, or consumption. And there's been a lot of work on you know, basic human needs. Uh, and there are various lists of those, those basic human needs. It's just one version. Uh, but uh, it's much broader than subsistence. Those contribute to people's subjective sense of well-being, uh, which has been, there's been a lot of research on that recently as well. You know, doing surveys of people's life satisfaction. We could ask you on a scale of one to 10, how satisfied are you with your life? All things considered right now. What do you think? One to 10? Nine, okay. <laughs> I think this talk is going well. <laughs> um, and those things are, you know, how, how these needs are fulfilled affect how that subjective well-being along with a lot of other factors. I is going to talk a little bit more about this, I think, in her, her talk. What we can do from a policy perspective, though, is how do we create the opportunities for people to meet those needs to, to feel the sense of subjective well-being? You know, and we can do that by how we arrange our assets, our built, our human, our social, and our natural capital, and how we use our time. So one of the main contributors to that uh, subjective well, to, to life satisfaction, to, to meeting human needs, is this idea of uh, ecosystem services, which are the benefits that humans derive from functioning ecosystems, from natural capital. Has this topic come up before in any of your, your lectures? Yeah, okay. This is fairly familiar territory. Good. Uh, and you might recognize this diagram from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, uh, which divided those services into these four basic categories of provisioning, regulating, cultural, and supporting services, and how they affect the various constituents of well-being that, that were uh, sort of covered in the previous slide. Uh, <clears throat> what they didn't do um, was look at the interaction uh, between those services and the other forms of capital. And so I think a, a better picture maybe uh, is one that looks something like this. We, you recognize that all four of these types of assets are required in some very complex interactions to produce sustainable well-being. It's not just natural capital flowing uh, into well-being. Uh, we've got to arrange the whole system in a way that produces this, those kinds of uh, that, those kinds of ongoing uh, services. So this is inherently a very transdisciplinary uh, kind of analysis. You're not going to understand that relationship just by looking at uh, the ecosystem, just by looking at uh, the market just by looking at any one part of the system. Uh, we've got to understand how those all interact together. There's been a lot of growing interest in ecosystem services. You've probably heard of the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which is kind of the IPCC equivalent uh, uh, these days. That's producing regular you know, assessments and, and uh, status and trends reports. Uh, you may have heard of the Ecosystem Services Partnership, uh, which is another uh, institution, and some of you may already be members of this of this uh, this group. I can see some heads nodding back there, uh, and there are regular meetings of this group, and you know, so uh, there's a lot of activity. <clears throat> there's a lot of activity in the academic literature as well. Uh, this is just a number of papers that have been published on this topic of ecosystem services uh, over the years, from 1984 to 2021, I think. So there's, you know, roughly there's more than 6,000 papers a year now published on this topic. Um, you know, over 40,000 papers altogether. So if you're doing a, a literature review for your PhD, it's gonna take, it's gonna take some time. Um, the most highly cited of these is one we did back in 1997, uh, where we tried to synthesize everything that had been done on 16, 17 different ecosystem services across 16 different biomes. Uh, this was done at um, a synthesis center. Uh, so it was a, a mixed group 
of individuals all you know, sort of trying to put this information together. And we came up with an estimate, you know, with a capital E, uh, of significantly larger than global GDP at the time. Uh, so one thing we didn't control was what they put on the cover of the, the magazine. We got the cover. That was great. But they put pricing the planet. We didn't really mean pricing as much as valuing. Uh, and that distinction, I think, is important. Uh, that we're not talking about trading these services in markets, we're talking about they contribute to human well-being in ways that are outside the market, essentially, most of it, uh, but extremely valuable. And you still need some way of comparing that contribution to well-being to other things that are inside the market. So uh, being able to state those results in monetary units, I think, was very helpful in making that comparison. Yeah, thank you. Any questions so far while I take a drink? Okay, onward. So more recently, um, we tried to estimate the changes from 1997 until 2011, in this case, in ecosystem services. And due to land use change, the desertification, loss of wetlands, loss of coral reefs, et cetera, we've lost, we estimate, up to $20 trillion a year in the contribution of these services to, to human well-being. Uh, <clears throat> we've also looked into the future. What do some scenarios look like uh, going out into the year 2050, in this case, um, <clears throat> of uh, ecosystem services under the Great Transition Initiative scenarios? We do business as usual. Things are going to get worse. If we do a policy reform sort of scenario, we can maybe uh, keep things from getting too much worse. Uh, however, uh, there's the possibility for the great transition to, to really uh, start looking at um, how we go into the future in a way that focuses on well-being. And I think this, this scenario also implies um, not growing GDP, uh, that we've stabilized GDP, we've stabilized population, we're reinvesting in, uh, in, in uh, natural ecosystems and in, in social capital. Uh, so it is possible to, uh, to make that transition. We know that... Um, Inequality and unfairness uh, are also uh, significantly negatively affecting uh, well-being. This is from uh, Kate Pitkin and Richard Wilkinson's book, The Spirit Level, uh, which some of you have probably seen. Uh, that showed if you plot income inequality versus a whole spectrum of, uh, of social problems, uh, you, you get this sort of very strong relationship. The more unequal a country is, uh, the higher this index of social problems. So. Um, the, and this, this affects our social capital, our sense of community, and it, I think directly affects our uh, societal well-being and our social well-being. We know that if you plot uh, GDP per capita versus life satisfaction, you get a graph that looks something like this. And this is, uh, I think Ida's going to talk more about this later, so I'll, I'll go quickly over this. It just implies that um, GDP is not really work we want to be using. And I'm sure you've covered uh, much of this in the course so far. Uh, even the, uh, you know, the architects of GDP acknowledge that this was not something you should be using as, a, as an index of national progress. It's really just a very narrow measure of marketed economic activity. So it's well past time, I think, to leave GDP behind as that primary policy goal and we need to move on uh, to some different kinds of indicators. Um, I won't go into details here because I think I'm just going to talk more about the genuine progress indicator as one possible uh, alternative, um, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, but we need things that can uh, incorporate uh, the, the uh, things that are left, the, the inequality, the, the distribution of income, the things that are left out of GDP, like household labor and volunteer work, and a whole bunch of things that shouldn't be counted as positives, you know, the loss of social and natural capital. And when you do that, you see that in many countries, and globally by this estimate, you know, we've moved from a period of, oops, of what Herman Daly has called, you know, true economic growth to a period of uneconomic growth. GDP is growing up. GPI, or genuine progress, when you account for growing inequality, loss of natural capital and social capital uh, is is stagnating or going down. We've been in that 
you know, a well-being recession, if you will, for, for decades now. So <clears throat> what do we have to do to create this sustainable well-being economy? I think it's first of all going to require um, breaking our addiction uh, to this growth at all costs paradigm uh, and to and, uh, and the overconsumption uh, of goods and services, in, at least in high income countries. Uh, so and I, and I talk about it as an addiction uh, because I think that's part of the reason that we haven't made faster progress. I think we've known about these issues uh, for, for decades now, uh, but <clears throat> we're stuck in the current system. Uh, because of all the positive reinforcements for the same reason that addicts get stuck in doing uh, in continuing to take drugs even when it's well known by themselves that it's uh, it's leading to uh, to really bad outcomes a key step in this therapy uh, for overcoming this addiction um, is to create a shared vision of what kind of future that we want and I'll talk a little bit more about that we did a paper recently where we we posed this question and said you know, what can we learn from um, what works to overcome individual addictions uh, to, you know, to apply at the societal scale? And it turns out that um, there's a therapy called motivational interviewing that seems to be quite successful at the individual scale. It does not confront addicts with their problem directly. It starts by engaging them in a discussion of their life goals, essentially. Uh, and it's only after you've established those life goals that you can go back and use that as a way to motivate, uh, to motivate real change. You know, <clears throat> the, the old joke you probably heard, you know, how many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? Anybody know the answer to that one? I'm sure some of you do. Only one, but the light bulb has to really want to change. <laughs> so how do you get society more broadly uh, to really want to change? And I think the, the first step there, at least one of the first steps, uh, one of the first steps is recognizing that there is a problem, but the second step is, um, you know, what are we trying to achieve? How do we establish our societal life goals? How do we, how do we change that? You know, as the famous American uh, psychologist and baseball player, Yogi Berra, once said, you know, if you don't know where you're going, you end up somewhere else. How do we really establish more, um, more broadly as a society where we all want to go? I think the uh, SDGs, which I'm sure you've all talked about, uh, if not in this class, at least you've heard about. Uh, <clears throat> who's, who's heard about the SDGs in this class? Okay, almost everybody. If you, if you pose that question to the broader society, what fraction of society do you think would answer, yes, I've heard about the SDGs? Any guesses? I don't, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> But I think that'd be a good survey. I don't think it's going to be a very high percentage. Five percent, ten percent, maybe one percent. Um, so it's great. I think this is a significant step in the history of, of humanity uh, that we've gotten at least at the policy scale, the government intergovernmental scale, we've got agreement on a set of goals that's much broader than <coughs> just GDP growth, even though that's still in there. Um, but I think it's it's tempered a bit at least by, by making it inclusive and, and et cetera. Uh, but <clears throat> a much broader set of goals, no poverty, no hunger, you know, uh, dealing with climate and, and uh, ecosystems. So they're, they're sort of all, all in there. Uh, but it hasn't really been uh, expanded out uh, to the discussion with the larger, the larger public. It's also presented as sort of 17 independent goals. Uh, so, but we know that there are synergies and trade-offs among those goals that they all contribute differently to these three broader goals that I mentioned in ecological economics and the overarching goal of you know, creating a prosperous, high quality of life that's, that's uh, equitably shared and sustainable. So how do we understand that complex system and, and how, we, how do we produce those overarching goals given uh, the different, different country context? And how do we engage the broader public uh, in having this discussion about the kind of world that we all want. Um, Ida and I produced this collection of, uh, of essays. I'm not sure if you had one in here, Tim. Probably I think not. I did, was this last did year? Was, yeah. This one, yeah. No, this no. came out about six, seven years oh, okay. ago. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and we asked them, you know, what would this sustainable and desirable future look like? You know, give us a narrative description uh, and also something about how we might get there. There's also been a lot of work on scenario planning. You know, what, how do we describe the possible futures? What are the what are the alternatives? And how do we 
uh, think about those as a way of understanding the, the pressures going forward and, and making better decisions about where we want to go. This again is from the Great Transition Initiative, uh, and they came up with these four basic archetypical scenarios, I think. You know, the business as usual, some sort of policy reform, uh, some sort of fortress world or collapse scenario, and some sort of great transition where we're all in this together. There's governance at many level, levels. There's stewardship and sharing. You know, and I think that's, that's sort of what the SDGs represent, at least they're in that, that category. So, um, but I think we need to, to sort of engage the broader public in having that discussion, you know, about what those futures actually could look like. So we can, you know, paint the picture a little bit better, uh, but I think we could probably go a lot further than that. Uh, so can we create, you know, films and videos and other ways of engaging the public? Can we do um, some sort of um, public opinion surveys? And we did one like this in Australia, where we, we used basically those same archetypical scenarios, changed the names a little bit, to make them a little less value-laden if you will, so you know, community well-being instead of the great transition. You could be against the great transition. You know. So, but <clears throat> uh, we made them a little less value-laden. And then we took a, uh, uh, a national survey with 2,000 participants, and this was a scientifically you know, distributed sample, and found that you know, well over 70% ranked this sustainable community well-being scenario as their highest, their highest preference, not everyone. And again, this was just a one-off survey where people read the description of these futures and then filled out a, you know, a preference survey. Uh, <clears throat> I think we need a lot more than that. We need to have deliberation, discussion groups. You know, we need to engage people in, in thinking about what kind of world do we all want? Uh, can we come to some broader consensus about that? We also, I think, need uh, to have better institutions for managing these common assets uh, going forward. Uh, and I'll talk really briefly about this, but I think there's a whole uh, research area for institutional design. How do we design institutions that can really manage our common assets, our natural and our social capital, in ways that, uh, that can sustain them, that can, uh, can, so they can continue to contribute uh, to our community well-being. And this idea of common asset trusts is one institution uh, that we've been working on based on um, Eleanor Ostrom's idea of what has worked historically uh, in communities to manage commons. You know, you probably heard of the, the tragedy of the commons. Um, well, it's not really the tragedy of the commons as much as it's the tragedy of open access to the commons. Uh, so you do have to have some clearly defined boundaries and you, you have to be able to, to limit access to the commons, but not necessarily uh, privatize them. Uh, so how do we create community property rights? Uh, on these common property resources. Uh, the idea of, for example, giving um, you know, the, the rights of individuals, the rights of people to, to rivers, like, uh, like they've done in New Zealand and a few other places. <clears throat> um, but there's a whole list of uh, sort of design principles that are necessary uh, for creating effective common asset or common management uh, institutions that I think we can begin to build on. We've been working with um, the state of Vermont uh, has actually drafted some legislation to create a Vermont Common Asset Trust. Um, we're working with people now in Costa Rica to do something similar as kind of the follow-on to their payment for ecosystem services system, uh, et cetera. And finally, how do we create the broader movement that's going to be required, I think, to make this transition to overcome our addiction to growth? And um, <clears throat> I've been involved in helping to set up this group called the Wellbeing Economy Alliance. Who's heard of this group before? Okay, a few of you. That's good. Um, the idea there is that there are, um, you know, we're not alone. Uh, there are a lot of people around the planet uh, who are thinking similar thoughts, who want this kind of, the kind of world that we've been describing, uh, but don't really have a venue uh, to, to, uh, to interact with others, uh, to move that agenda forward. <coughs> Within this group is also the uh, well-being economy governments group um, established by Nicola Sturgeon, the first minister of Scotland. And if you haven't seen her TED talk on this, I, I uh, highly recommend that you take a look at that. Um, 
And of course, there's um, Jacinda Ardern from uh, New Zealand, who's established the first you know, well-being um, uh, budget uh, for her country and is, uh, is definitely part of this well-being economy governments group. Um, Iceland has joined that group. Um, <clears throat> Finland has joined that group. Wales has joined the group. And I think Canada has just joined this group. So ultimately, can we have, you know, instead of the G7 or the G20, we have the WE7 or the WE20, you know, the governments that get together and say, well, how do we improve our country's well-being, not just our country's uh, GDP? So I think that will help move that agenda forward. <clears throat> and you take a look at the website, here's where we all and, and potentially join if, you, uh, if you'd like uh, to help join this broader global alliance about the kind of world that we really want. How can we build back better? How can we use the crises that we've gone through uh, to help you know, shake things up enough to say we've, gotta, we've really got to make some changes. This is an opportunity uh, for us uh, you know, to, to apply the kind of therapy that I think is needed uh, to overcome our addiction to growth. So <clears throat> um, we started back in with ecological economics back in 1990, 1991, uh, with some intermediate papers um, and books. And this is the latest book that has just come out in 2020 uh, that Ida and I, John Erickson, Josh Farley edited, uh, which is a collection of, of very different views about you know, what ecological, what the sustainable um, well-being futures could be and what the research and action agenda is for those futures. So I encourage you to take a look at that, at that book. I think I gave the introductory paper uh, to Tim to distribute to you guys, so you can take a look at that. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, we have, we have uh, just under half an hour for questions, 20, 25 minutes, certainly. And I'm sure there will be some. Um, I've also invited, if you haven't seen in the chat box, those of you who are online, I've invited anyone who would like to raise a question from the online audience to post it in the chat box. And I have one ready form, which I'm just going to throw at you because I think it's such a good question. I mean, we talked at the beginning about the emergence of ecological economics and as a challenge to mainstream economics. So Duncan Austin is asking, do you see any of the influential defenders of conventional mainstream economics starting to reappraise their non-ecological economics in the light of the realities of the anthrop Anthropocene um, and the seemingly unstoppable ascendancy of systems thinking, which should tilt all economics in the direction of ecological economics. Yeah, <clears throat> should. I should have done long ago, but... <laughs> Yeah, I think there are a couple, uh, like Joe Stiglitz, I think is, um, is beginning to get uh, the idea. He's, he certainly was a major uh, contributor to this Sarkozy Commission about beyond GDP. Uh, so I think he understands that, that the goal is not GDP growth. The goal is, is well-being uh, somehow more broadly defined. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, yeah, I had some follow-on. Notes there. Oh, you want to go back? Yeah, that's fine. That's, that's okay. Fair. Let's put, them, yeah. put it back. That's okay. I was hoping we could, I could just show you each other because um, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> there are a lot okay. of people online, but I'll put you back on to your presentation. Um, yeah, Jeffrey Sachs seems to be getting the idea, but I'm, I'm, I'm always a little um, hesitant. But it, it seems to be, <laughs> but he seems to be saying the right things. Um, you know, and the whole idea of, of the uh, World Happiness Report and focusing much more on subjective well-being rather than, than GDP. So I think that's that's been coming across. I think a lot from the economics uh, community. Um, I don't know who else can you can you think of? There's uh, Institute for New Economic Thinking. I don't know if you yeah, mentioned yeah. them. So that's quite an interesting initiative, and another one in the UK, which is rethinking economics, uh, which was led post financial crisis actually with the government putting money into funding economics to think differently about itself, which was quite interesting. Um, I guess. But I guess the, the point of ecological economics is that economics by itself is not going to be enough to, to really do economics properly. You've got to look at the whole system. And the economy is part of that system. The economy is not a separate thing that you study all by itself. And as long as you consider that to be the case, that oh, we're economists, we study the economy, whatever that is, you know, that, that subsystem, um, then I think you're going to miss miss the point. And so I think that the future really is not in economics departments; it's in transdisciplinary institutes, you know, like this one. 
Yeah, I mean, just to go a little bit further with Duncan's question, um, one of the interesting things about starting up a field and moving it along is that actually it begins to have an increased presence. And of course, you can sort of document that for ecological economics, can't you? In the, in the beginning, nobody had heard of it. Nobody. And, and one of the academic performance indicators, if you like, of course, is the, the ranking of the journals that you're publishing in. But it is actually a journal that's now very highly ranked amongst, amongst economics journals. Yes, and amongst environment journals, and amongst ecology journals. So I think that's the, the difference. It's not just an economics journal. And it was, <clears throat> we had a hard time deciding at the very beginning what to call it. You know, is it going to be ecological economics, or ecology and economics, or you know, <clears throat> some other, something that said, it's not just economics. It's about really a trans, it's a transdiscipline rather than a, than a discipline. I think that's always been, and will probably continue to be, a, a, a confusion going forward. Yeah, just been yeah. wrapped over the knuckles now, rightly so, by someone who says, "Don't forget about rethink economics," um, <laughs> which is, uh, you know, it's a really important kind of student-led actually initiative to change yes. economics from the inside. Yeah, indeed. So I always think, um, you know, the laws of supply and demand. Just when just students are beginning to demand a different kind of economics then professors are going to have to supply it. Um, obviously, this professor's been doing that for a while, but not all mainstream ones have. But there were some really interesting instances in after the financial crisis when students boycotted mainstream macroeconomic professors because, basically, they left a note on his door saying, we're not turning up to your lectures because you're not talking about anything we're interested in. And, and it was, you know, one of those moments where actually students were demanding to hear different things. So I've got a few more questions here, but I would like to take some from the floor. Yes, Claire. Um, it strikes me that this is, a, this is all makes absolute sense, but you're not getting through to the people who make the changes. Um, and I'm meaning not necessarily governments, but I mean the civil service, because if you can get through to the civil servants, who then feed ideas to their um, MPs, etc. Then I think that the word would be spread quicker. I, I speak as a district councillor, mm -hmm. and I know that our officers, who are really the civil service, they put up barriers all the time. So I'm a, a cabinet member for climate change, and I will put an idea to them, and they'll go, no, 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 can't do that. Yeah. However, I've been doing it for nearly three years now, and gradually, they've come over. But it's only because I badger them. <laughs> now, we haven't got MPs who are, we've got people in opposition who are that keen, but we haven't got, it strikes me that George Eustace is not really into changing much about the environment, really. Um, it just seems that, that just seems, that, that would seem, a, it's an education thing of get, getting through to the civil service, therefore the MPs. I think it is an education thing, partly, but I think there's also this, you know, addiction aspect. Yes. That the, the you know, the, the, the interests that are funding certain aspects of the government, uh, you know, don't want to change. Yes. Mm. <laughs> so how do you overcome that? How do you overcome? You that, give them therapy. That, <laughs> therapy? No, you do. You, yeah. you get. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an NLP master. Yeah. And if you talk one to one to these people, they will suddenly say, "Oh, that's not my core value." I exactly. Need yeah. So how? To, and I think the, the the way to do that, or at least one way to do that, would be not to say, "Here's what we have to do. We have to start changing this." You know, that's that's sort of the conventional you know approach with with addicts. But that's gets, that's counterproductive. You've got to talk about something completely different, yeah. which is what kind of world do you want? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, let's not talk about what to do next. What kind of world do you want? Establish that much more broadly than we have so far, and then you can say, okay, well, if that's the kind of world you want, why are you doing this? <laughs> you know, that's going to just lead you off in the wrong direction. We got to stop doing that and start, start doing this differently. But then you've motivated them to, to understand the reason for the, that change and, and why it has to happen, mm -hmm. and probably also to understand, you know, why they're still addicted to the current the current system. You know, well, if we do that change. You know, these people are going to stop funding us, and if they stop funding us, what are we going to do next? Well, you know, you got to work through all of that, I think. But I think thinking of it more as an addiction sort of helps yeah. understand why it's not changing Definitely. as quickly as it should. You know, you should be able to just say, you know, hey, this all makes sense. Why aren't we doing this? Yeah. I think that's 
that's what I've struggled with for a long time. I think I've finally come to this conclusion that, that we've got to think of it differently if we really want uh, the behavior to change. So this is a related question. I'll, I'll come to you. Hanson, you have your hand up, yeah? And Ben at the back as well, and Joel. Um, there's a related question just coming through from here. Um, just, are we limited by our imagination? Um, we can be, I think, but I think that's one of the, the key um, <clears throat> aspects of humans, that we can imagine you know, different futures. We have imagination. Uh, we're not limited by what happens next. We can design things, you know, we can create these alternative futures. We can create these visions, you know, and we do it all the time, you know. I mean, when you're designing a building, you, you're not just sort of looking around at all the materials and starting to put them randomly together. You're saying, I have a, you have to have a clear vision of what it is you're, you're trying to produce at the end. And I don't think we have that, you know, for our, our whole society, or at least we're in the process of developing that, but I think that's what we need to spend more time on. I think that's really what democracy should be all about, is creating that shared vision. Because once you got that, then it's just, you know, <clears throat> um, it, it's just the details of how to, how to get there how to put it together. Not that they're not important as well. You, know, you have to have the craftsmen that can create the building that you want. But if you don't have the design in the first place, you're never gonna, you're never gonna get there. Good, let's pick up on some of these themes. Are you going in the same direction, Hansel, with your question, yeah. or something similar? Yeah, okay, let's do that. Let's go there. I wanna ask about, um, you said that one of the ways to get people on the side of global economics is to as for like the, their worldview, right? What the goals are? What happens if you, if like the powerful leaders and like CEOs and everything don't have the worldview, a better world? Mm -hmm. They just want you know money. <laughs> that's so where we are now. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's where. That's why we're stuck. I think yeah. partly where we are because those current leaders are espousing worldviews that are that are part of the you know the business as usual system. They're just continuing to say we need more more stuff, more growth, that's the solution to all of our problems, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> yeah, that's, that's the addiction. Uh, so getting out of that I think, is what we're, we're trying so to do. That means electing, electing new leaders, basically. A political yeah. challenge there. Yeah, it's, it's a political challenge, for sure. Yeah. How do we get new leaders elected? Well, I think the general population has to, has to also understand these issues uh, in order to yeah vote for um, leadership that's going to uh, be consistent with the kind of world that they want, to, they want to see. And it's been amazing for me, you know, when you get people from very different backgrounds, you'd think they would never agree with each other, into a room and say, uh, let's talk about the kind of world that we want in the year 2070 or whatever. <clears throat> they pretty much agree. <laughs> you know, there's a lot more consensus there than you would expect uh, because you're taking them out of their current you know, locked in kind of addictive position, saying, imagine a world that's, that, you know, what kind of world would you like it to look like? Um, <clears throat> it reminds me also of John Rawls' idea of, you know, what is a fair, what is a fair society look like? You have to take people out of their current position and say, imagine you were designing the system from scratch, you know, and you don't know where you're going to be in this new system. You know, you're just, and if you don't know where you're going to be, you had better design a system where no matter where you end up, it's going to be fine. So that that imagination, that envisioning exercise, that you know, thinking about alternative futures, I think is a key part of solving the problem that we haven't haven't really explored enough yet. Okay, we've got two or three people, so I'm just going to take a few and um, maybe line them up together if we can. Yeah. Um, ben, Dan, and Joel. We'll just take those three, and then we'll come back to the online. Uh, okay, yeah, I just want to follow up on that line of argument, really. Um, do you think that this kind of um, therapy model is a sufficient theory of change, given the capacity for bad faith actors? I mean, usually, I presume, when you do this kind of international interview, you don't have the drug dealer in the room with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so do, do we need something more, um, something that addresses the power dynamics that are more directly. For sure. <laughs> um, but I think that's <clears throat> that's part of the discussion that we could have as as a broader society, you know, to recognize that 
part of the reason we're not making changes, you know, is the fossil fuel industry was has been, you know, subsidizing uh, <clears throat> and misinforming the public, you know, for uh, for years now. So exposing that is one thing, but bringing that out in a broader, you know, discussion among the among civil society, and even having them in the room with you, uh, I think there are a lot of executives in the fossil fuel industry that would pretty much agree. Yes, we've got to stop burning fossil fuels, but they're as locked in, as stuck, as addicted to the system as, as anybody else. You know, their jobs uh, depend on continuing to sell fossil fuels. So um, you've got, we've got to step away from that short-term you know, uh, interaction and somehow have that, that broader social discussion, I think, to, to get past this. And to get past the, the sort of existing power dynamics. Those power dynamics can change. Historically, they have. You know, we've had revolutions in the past when things are so bad that people can't take it anymore. Do we have to wait for the system to collapse before we rebuild it, or can we you know, somehow make this transition more, more, uh, more, more equitably, <clears throat> more smoothly? I mean, it, it's interesting, just at the meta level, one of the things you're suggesting that the, the field of ecological economics actually has to be broad enough to include psychology. Mm. And, um, I mean, I know the answer yeah. to this question, but is the Ecological Economics Journal willing to publish papers that are about psychology? I think it is. I think it should be. I'm not the editor-in-chief anymore, but <laughs> um, I would certainly uh, support that. Um, mm. And I, at least when I was the editor-in-chief, I, I was very supportive of you know publishing papers that crossed whatever disciplinary boundaries you know were uh, mm. uh, made sense. You know, I mean, um, we, we were not trying to be uh, an economics journal. We were not trying to be an ecology journal. We were trying to be, you know, a, a much broader transdisciplinary journal. <clears throat> and I'm not sure everyone who submits papers to the to journal understands that. Mm. But, uh, I mean, the, I, the, the answer that I know to that question is yes, because Amy has published a, a yeah. paper, and uh, Amy and I have published a paper in that. So it is, I mean, it, it is, is still, actually, yeah. it is yeah. inclusive. It is still doing, yes. Yeah. Which is great. Um, so my question is, it's great to have a vision, and it's an amazing vision, but how do you do it on a, you know, in, a re in real life? How do you actually do it practically? How do you, in inclusive society is amazing, but how do you, basically it means everyone is equal. Yeah. And what do you do with the haves and have nots, those who worked and something do you just take it away from that mm -hmm. well, I mean, what, what, what yeah. are the practicalities of it it is it is a challenge but it has it happens all the time you know at different scales uh, so you know even companies when they want to change <clears throat> they get the you know the group together even, not just the leadership but probably the employees as well and say let's think about a new vision for the company communities can do this at a smaller scale in Vermont they have um, their governance system is based around town meetings. So, you know, they don't, they, everybody once a year comes to a town meeting, everybody, you know, that lives in the town, they sit around a table like this, and they say, well, you know, what do we want to do with the town? Uh, so that's kind of the direct democracy approach. But scaling it up is, is an issue. And I think that's the challenge. How do we get bigger societies, whole countries? Whole country is the whole, the whole. You can talk world. about deliberative democracy. Deliberative democracy is kind of what the, what the Vermont town meeting is about. And one of the ideas in deliberative democracy is that the representation should not necessarily be by voting. The representation should be about random selection you know, from the population. Yeah. Sortition, as it's called. Yeah. And if you did that, you'd actually have a more representative sample you know, of a larger population. They deliberate. You know, with each other, they bring in experts. You know, as they need, but the experts support the deliberation. They don't, God, they don't lead the, the deliberation. And if you do that, um, it, they generally come to decisions that are, you know, that are better, that are more, li more, more uh, likely to achieve these kind of shared goals that we're that we're talking about. And I don't think we have the answers yet, but I think that's the challenge going forward: is how do we do that? How do we scale that up? We have communication technology these days that is amazing and we've never had before, mm -hmm. you know, in, in human history. We can communicate with the whole planet, you know, in real time, basically. Um, we're not using it 
you know, for very good reasons at the, at the moment, but we could. So think about that. How would we do that? Are you working on a master's or a PhD or? A PhD. Yeah. Um, Joel, I think you're next. Thank you for pretty interesting. Um, my question is quite similar to my answer, to be honest. But um, I get there isn't really anything to answer to this, but if ecological economics has been around for 20 plus years, I guess my, my two questions are number what, what, what do you think is its greatest achievement for the discipline so far? And number two, then you were talking about the, um, uh, I find an example of replacing GDP with different well being budgets. Um, just in, in practice, then, uh, assuming none of them have been perfect, what do you see as the great application of ecological economics on a national policy making level thus far? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, it's hard to say because, um, like I said, this is not the only uh, way of describing the kinds of things that, that I'm talking about. Uh, so I don't think it would be possible to you know, point out, say, this, is, this happened because of ecological economics. But I think it's part of that complex mix and discussion that's been going on for the last 25 years uh, that is also embedded in a lot of the other you know, ways of talking about it that, that I mentioned. Uh, but I think they're all leading to the, to the point that you know, inequality is much more of an issue these days. You know, 10 years ago, it wasn't really an issue. Uh, you know, natural capital ecosystem services, I think, are a huge issue these days where it wasn't. 10 years or five, even five years ago. Um, you know, thinking about the whole system, uh, systems thinking, maybe they've gotten more, uh, more traction. Um, so yeah, and, and like I said, um, I think one of the beaten pushbacks is, well, you've been doing this for 25 years and you know, nothing's really changed, so you know, maybe you're not doing the right thing. Well, I think we're still talking about the fact that we're in this addicted uh, scenario. So the fact that things are not changing quickly is not necessarily uh, the fault of, of, the, of the therapist. Uh, it's the fault of the fact that we're, we are strongly addicted and we haven't figured out quite the right therapy yet. Um, yeah, so I've got three people and one person online that I want to bring in. So um, Sean, Simon, Claire, all three questions and then I'll go to a question online. We'll take all the questions at once. Um, yeah, thank you, and the talk was fantastic. And so I, I'm just going to pick up on uh, your point there about ecosystem services, and it seems to be becoming very embedded in like policy circles, government level, and so on, at least in the EU and Britain here, and all, and all of that. Uh, I'm wondering, is there, in, in an economic uh, sense, to escape your thoughts on this, is there like a danger when you're saying, yes, you're not trying to price nature and so on, but you're trying to place a value on it in one of your terms, the way the policy makers and government understand. And is there a danger that that then reduces nature, instead of, say, natural systems and natural capital, mm -hmm. to the same sorts of like crude cost-benefit analysis that the other things are? So if I'm an MP or a minister and I say, well, we, you know, this is worth the X, but we might get X by cutting it down or and so on, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, I just I read uh, criticism of all that in the past, and just to get like, your response to that, and you know, should we be trying to push a more intrinsic value of nature? I know that's very leafy and it doesn't work in policy circles. Maybe that's the answer. Um, I think it depends on who you're. Bob, let me take the three together, okay. so we can hope to get another couple of online questions. So that's about intrinsic values of nature versus pricing nature, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Simon. Yeah, thanks, Bob. And um, my question is about, I think. What you think of the fundamental analytical concepts in ecological economics, and thinking, thinking about your repeated use here of this kind of addiction metaphor and therapy metaphors, and the thing that strikes me in how you're talking about the economy is you're not using a, an analytical concept that I think I'm increasingly trying to use, which is capitalism going beyond capitalism. I think you could speak to how useful or not you think that is strategic. Brilliant, brilliant. Pricing, yeah. capitalism, and... Um, I want to go back to spreading the word. Um, it, we've had people like Attenborough get on the bandwagon, um, environment, etc. And Davina McCall on um, uh, uh, mature women. Um, is it a fa the fact that we actually need someone who is well-known to actually take this on, to actually spread the word? Um, 
because uh, it's, it's obviously not happening. I mean, you asked the question about SDGs. I mean, my, my council doesn't know a, a single thing about them, right. and that really that really worries me. And podcasts are taking off, aren't they? These, the, all these sort of things are ways for more people to actually get to know about this, mm. and young influencers. Yeah. All right. Maybe in reverse order, that would be great. If we, oh yes. yes. If we had some. Uh, you know, some media stars that started to, to, uh, to, to bring up these ideas. I think that's part and parcel of this larger social discussion that I think we need to, need to have about our, about our future. And there have been a very few uh, sort of major films about positive short-term futures. Uh, there's one called 2040. I'm not sure if you've run across that. Uh, but if you haven't, take a look. Um, <clears throat> we've been talking with the, the guy who made that film uh, about you know, can we produce some short videos that we can use to, to sort of encourage broader discussion and maybe get some, some media stars you know, to, to appear in those and start you know, getting that, that message out there. Yeah. But I think that would really help to, to engage with the broader public. Mm. We can get some you know, blockbuster videos mm. uh, that had to do with mm. what kind of future do we want or, or you know, some of the issues around the problems with, with GDP growth. All of that would, would certainly help. Um, Beyond capitalism, I think we definitely, well, this here is the terminological issue, you know, like what do you mean by capitalism exactly? Um, I know um, Peter Barnes, you know, talked about capitalism 3.0. We need to reboot capitalism. You know, we don't, we certainly don't or can't continue with the kind of capitalism that we have now, at least in, in many countries. Are the Scandinavian countries, you know, are they, is their approach to capitalism with much more social, Welfare and much more concern for the natural environment embedded in it. You know, maybe that's that's a transition. But in the end, I think we need a system that that considers you know the, the whole system, all of our assets, including our natural and social capital. Uh, but I'm not sure that that would classify as you know what many people think of as capitalism. I think it's more well-being kind of thinking about it. So, what do you call that? You know, Lagoon is a good term. <laughs> So we can get to that to that point. Um, ecosystem services, um, I think those, you know, thinking of them as contributors, you know, in a, to well-being that we can quantify in some way and, and, and express in, in monetary units versus thinking of the intrinsic value. I don't think those are mutually exclusive ideas. They're going to communicate better with different with different audiences. Uh, in both cases, you're still saying, you know. Natural capital, natural resources are valuable. You know they contribute to to what we think is important. Um, so I don't think the intrinsic value idea is completely separate from people either, because it's the people who are saying that these things have intrinsic value. It's not not any, any other part of the system. So <clears throat> those are not mutually exclusive, um, you know, ideas. And how you frame them, I think, is depends on who you're trying to communicate with. And um, <clears throat> there was another side to this too. What were they going to say? You value everything anyway. It's when you make trade-offs. <laughs> right. We're doing this valuation anyway. You know, it's not like something you can you can avoid. Oh, and I know the other the other misconception I think is people think if you quantify these things in monetary units, you're talking about privatizing them. You're not talking about privatizing. Them. That's that's a confusion. You're really talking about how do we understand how they contribute to our you know, community value, not our, not our private value. So. Good. A couple of questions online, um, just to not let you get away too lightly. We'll take a break in a minute. Um, well, but um, the, one of the questions online is kind of about the sector specificity. So, for example, if you're working, as this question of the theme was in, in the tourism and transport, in particular air travel sector, are ecological, economics, and degrowth approaches relevant at that sector level? I don't see why not. I mean, like I said, it's trying to understand the whole system, and you can't understand the whole system without looking at you know the, the, the pieces and how they how they interact. Uh, so I think you, you do have to you know get down uh, to some level. And it's it's about you know how do you make how do you how do you make models of these systems essentially. And one of my favorite sayings is you know all models are wrong, but some are useful. So you're not going to get the truth, you know, out of any any level of modeling that you do, 
uh, but you are looking for something that's you know, complex enough to help you understand the issues, to help you make good decisions about, about where, how to go forward. And not so complicated that you know, you're just, you're just uh, sort of overwhelming uh, our ability to, to make any, any decisions at all. But recognizing that you know, the standard economic model, which they present as being this is the way the world is, is just a model. You know, might work in some, some, for some things in some periods, uh, might be helpful. But it's well past, I think, its general applicability to the range of problems that we have now um, in the Anthropocene. So we need a new model uh, that's, that's more useful. And I yeah, think that's another another about. question from online is um, that, that kind of slide you showed with the kind of plethora of different terms describing the desirable economy. Is there a danger that, that those, those different ideas compete with each other and we want them to be collaborative? Mm -hmm. That's a great question, and we've thought about this a lot. <laughs> because ecological economics was intended to be pluralistic. You know, we're not saying that there is one right way, one right way to do this. Um, but we live in what Deborah Tannen has called the argument culture, you know, where everything is cast as, as a debate. As you know, there's I'm right and you're wrong, or that this is you know correct and incorrect, and and that you know it might be uh, the right way to approach certain kinds of problems. But the things that we're talking about are much more complex and nuanced than that. Uh, so we have to get out of the argument culture and into the deliberation, the discussion, you know, the consensus building kind of uh, culture. Uh, but you know, not everybody's in that culture, so <laughs> you end up, you know, having these debates about, you know, well, I want to differentiate my thing from your thing, as opposed, even though they overlap by quite, by quite a bit. Uh, instead of trying to differentiate them, let's look at what are the common features and how do we build, build consensus. I think that's what ecological economics is trying to do. Excellent. Um, thank you, Bob. Um, we have lots of, uh, there were a few more questions online. We won't get to apologies to that, to our online audience, and I'm sure there's plenty that you would like to follow up on here as well. Um, Bob is going to be around a little bit longer because he and I have traveled down together. So if you want to catch him during the break, I'm sure that would be fine. Many congratulations from thanks, and thanks actually particularly for making this accessible to non-economists from the <laughs> online audience, and I'm sure from you guys as well. And um, thank you very much for spending your time with us today.